Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Comeback Podcast with Mark Jensen. Today, I've got Matt Monero. I've been watching this guy for a while. Um, he doesn't know why I was watching him. I'm about to tell him here in a couple minutes. But uh, Matt, we take you a minute and go ahead and introduce yourself to all my listeners and the people we're gonna, you and I are both going to get to know. Sounds great. My name is Matt Monero. I come to you out of Dallas, Texas. I'm an author, uh, father, husband, and a business owner. Um, started my business from scratch 23 years ago, literally with a phone and a folding table and a yellow pages. Uh, since then, we've done well over a billion bucks. We'll do 150 million bucks a year. We're one of the largest uh, finance companies in the transportation space, and it's been a wild, wild ride. What is, what is the name of the company? Commercial Fleet Financing. Awesome. And then and you've got places all over the place or you just right out of Dallas? No, we have a single headquarters uh, here in Dallas, Texas. It connects to our company culture. I want people coming to my office every day. I want them to buy into what we're doing. I want to see their faces. I want to see their freaking work ethic. I want to make sure that they're pushing. Okay. Um, I believe that most people, when they work out of their house for a company, um, you don't get, you don't get their best. I think they're changing light bulbs. I think they're walking to the freaking mailbox. I think they're going out to lunch with their wives. I think they're making up excuses why they're not working. They're lying to their employer. And I want my freaking people here. I want to see your fucking face every day. I like the sound. I've, I've watched, I remember one video that sticks out right now. It was about a chair that you were pushing through the office, right? Do you remember, do you remember that video? Yeah. That was one of the things that, uh, that uh, introduced me to you. But also one of the, the things I, I like about you is the hustle, the early mornings, the work. I see you every morning in the pool, free in some freezing ass cold water. Yeah, right? yeah I love it. Yeah, and you're you're doing these things, and you're making the videos, and your consistency is key. Which, well, I mean, it's is it real, right? I mean, you know, anybody can dip in a pool for a minute and and dip out, or some guys will dip in and not show you the thermometer. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I I want people to understand that you know habit is the key, and and. And the, the level of uncomfortableness that you get into is the habit you need to get into. I right. mean, uh, and I know it, it sounds cliche now. I've heard so many people in the bank meeting, I'm just leaving. I mean, the guy, you know, guy's talking about getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Well, I mean, that sounds good until you get into 46 degree water in the freezing cold rain when, when it's freezing outside. I mean, what is your level of uncomfortable that you're talking about? You're talking about making a few extra fucking phone calls or are you talking about sitting your ass in 46 degree water for eight minutes? You, right. you know what I'm saying? Right. And, and I know that about you. You know the point of uncomfortable that I'm talking about. Uncomfortable is, is blackness, dude. It's darkness. It's the abyss. Yes. And the ability to do it often. Is so important. many people, that's because you have so many people say they're so fucking afraid of the fear of the unknown. Dude, but at the same yeah. time, guys like you, who I look up to, and guys like myself, we've lived in the unknown for so long, and I wouldn't have it any other fucking way because the darkness sometimes pushes and it makes me thrive and makes me want more, as I'm sure it does you. Dude, I've seen despair. I mean, I've seen darkness. And, and those are wonderful moments for me. Those are not – I don't want to go back to them, right. but I'm certainly not afraid of them. And I know you've seen exactly what I'm talking about. Absolutely. I, uh, one of the thoughts on my mind right now is – I had to hate where I was at at that moment more than I loved where I was going to get the fuck out of it. Yeah, yeah right? that's great, man. <laughs> that's awesome. And, and, and that, that thought's been on my mind every single day, and that's actually thriving me now to level up to my next level, like why I reached out to you on a podcast. I mean, I'm a, I just got some other business opportunities that I'm doing. I'm about to go buy some suits and try to level up my game and try to look like you guys, right? Um, it's important, man. I mean, it's really, it's an important thing. It's this determination of truly, can you walk the walk? And um, I just see so many people who, who, who take this first step and the first step doesn't mean anything to me. The fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, 15th, 25th, those are the only steps that I care about. The first step just doesn't mean anything to me. I, I agree. It's how much can you, how much are you willing to get punched in the mouth? How much struggle can you get up and push through every day? How much are you willing to not quit at, right? Like, what are you, what are you willing to be uncomfortable with? Like your guy said in the banker, the banker's meeting, what's his level of uncomfortableness, right? Maybe. Yeah, look, I mean, his, his level of uncomfortable is talking about doing direct mail or an email campaigns and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, all right. I mean, I'm down with that. Great. If you guys think that that enhances our relationship and your value to us, I'm okay with that. But, you know, listen, dude, uncomfortable to me is, is, you know, wondering, you know, how much worse can it get? 
And right. what I mean by that is like knowing how bad it can get and it gets worse. Right. That's what, that's the abyss, man. Like and that. I'm not afraid of that fucking place ever. What was your, uh, what was your background? So before, before you became at Monero, this, you know, business tycoon, this guy who's building and now you're becoming a social media presence, which you've been for a while, but now it seems like it's really kicking up. Go back before when you were younger, like what, what, what got you here? Yeah, dude, my real dad left when I was six months old, left my mother and I high and dry. I never saw him. I never met him before. That changed my life. Sounds bizarre to think that you would know it as six month old, but I didn't, but I did. In other words, as soon as my first memory hit me at about age four, I knew it was different. Okay. Um, it was not the same existence for me. My mother remarried to a guy who is my dad and I love him as my father, but he was a tough guy. Uh, you know, berated my sister and I every day, called us idiot, morons, retards. I grew up my entire existence. My adolescence was being told how stupid I was. And, and that just fueled me, man. I was the underdog from the beginning and I'm still the underdog today. And that's the only way I know how to operate. I do not know how to operate from on top. I only know how to operate from a place of push and fire and brimstone. And uh, those are, those are blessings and curses, man. I agree. I miss, no. I miss a lot of good shit that I should be seeing because I'm fighting and scrapping and clawing all the time. Some people, and I can relate to that 100%, but some people will say that when I operate like that as well, I'm from a place of scarcity versus abundance. But the truth is I don't know how to, I, I'm after abundance, right? But the scarcity is what pushes me. The, the, I'm not focused on it. It's just, I don't want to fucking go back. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to define what scarcity is, right? I mean, you know, I'm, my, my definition of scarcity is chasing guys like Ed Milet and Cardone, right? right. So, I mean, are you, we, have to, we have to move our level of scarcity up. Otherwise, we end up always in the same definition of scarcity, which is, fuck, how am I going to put food in the fridge, right? right? I mean, we can move our levels of scarcity up. So, um, it's important to do that. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with hunger and ambition and, and uh, excitement and fire and desire, man, too many people squash that shit. Too many people are afraid of that. And once they get a little of it, they just go right back into this place of pull my hand off the throttle because they're so afraid that their spouse is going to not like them anymore or their parents are giving them shit or their friends are wondering why they're doing that. It just, dude, it's all about what is your own individual potential. And it just took me too freaking long to understand that. And now I'm not looking back. How long did it take you to realize that? In all, in all frankness, it probably took me 40 of my 48 years to even remotely understand who I was competing against. I always thought I was competing against everybody else, and now I, I'm only competing against my God-given potential. I'm not an overly religious guy. I don't go to church a lot, but I believe in a higher faith, and I know that I was put on this earth to do more than I've done. I believe that, too. And I've done some shit, you know, <laughs> but I know, that I'm, I know that I'm just getting started. Right. So I'm going to give you a little background of, of why I – Obviously, I like the, uh, the the videos and the stuff you did, but my family owned trucking companies, just single trucks, owner operators from you know, the time I was a baby. When you look back at some of my, my baby pictures, I was wearing a freaking diaper with nunchucks and a, a Doberman pitcher crawling into the uh, cab over Peterbilt, right? Like nice, literally man. doing that stuff. So my uncle, that was his dream, and he's the guy who pretty much raised me. He was the man that got me to become who I wanted to be. Oh, your uncle raised you? Yeah. Well, my dad, my dad, my dad raised me to a point and then my brother raced motocross and they, they went out chasing his dream and I was stayed with my uncle. Right. Wow. So okay. From the 14, 15, 16, 17, you know, I was in and out struggling. That's my, it's a blessing and a curse. I had a great guy to teach me how to make money, how to be an entrepreneur in business, but he also taught me how to drink. Where was right? your mom during all that? My mom and dad got divorced and she, you know, they were young. So she went and did her, did her own thing, right? No you know? kidding. Don't yeah. You. So, so he was, he was raising me. My, I was bounced from couch to couch, but that's not the, the purpose of this story. We can talk about that later. He died when I was 27. I was living in Southern California. I was working on dirt bikes. I came back. He had cancer. He had a, he, he beat it after three years, got a clean bill of health on a Friday and he died on Wednesday on his fucking Harley. Mm, went unbelievable. out. Unbelievable. He, he thought he was, he thought he was invincible. He just beat cancer, right? So he went out drinking with his buddies and fucking next thing you know, he's dead. Wow. So he had a trucking company that was in shambles. He had one truck, a couple accounts. It was like a, an older Peterbilt, some trailers. I went in, I tried to save it. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing, right? 
but I was basically baptized by fire. I walk into this pit and I, I saw instantly the money, all these different things. I tried to save it. I couldn't do it. I started up a new company and I grew that thing from one truck to 43 trucks. I had 78 employees. I was running around the clock for generic power systems. I built three, um, three PL warehouses in Southern Wisconsin. I was rolling, right? I was buying out some uh, plastics division companies, some scrap companies. But as you know, my addiction started setting in and I fucking took my, I was so after the money, which I loved, I started, I lost everything. Okay. Wow. I literally lost that whole company. We did 75. Uh, we, we did really well. We did like 75 million in my tenure of running that business. I got down to my last $200. Hmm. I, the, the contacts I had, I started another trucking company and I turned that into six, you know, a 6 million operation with just a handful of trucks inside of a year. And I walked away from it because I wasn't happy with it. No kidding. Holy shit. So yeah, man, I, I, I'll tell you this. I had a uh, Generac power systems. I'm sure you're familiar with who they are. Yeah. I went in, I did all their in-house transportation. So I, I lined them up. I had like 300 trailers for them to spot, you know, move back and forth. It was the biggest account I ever had. I just signed a $27 million contract right about a month and a half before I lost my business. Hmm. The reason tell I lost. Me, yeah. Tell me why you lost the business. Well, the, the drugs and okay. alcohol for sure. I was living, I like to believe I got cocky and I got arrogant, right? And I was making a bunch of money. And at the same time, I did it all without loans, right? So I bought and bought and bought and I had all my skin in the game. I was coming in and was going to get a account, account to come in and like help me with my books because I didn't really know what I was doing. Right? I knew what I was doing, but I didn't really know like what the fuck I was doing, right? I could grow the company and get the work. Anyways, this guy came in, he saw the amount of money I was making. I was buying out their other companies. I went to Jamaica for a while. I fell off the wagon pretty hard in Jamaica. I came back. My company was, was mm -hmm. folding. They went in after my accounts. I had an issue with the IRS. They turned me into the IRS. They mm -hmm. put a fucking stall on my, on, on my money coming in from a factoring company I had to use, mm -hmm. right? Because I was growing on my own money. And next yeah, thing I was done. What about the free and clear titles though for the equipment? Weren't you able to liquidate trucks? Well, and I, I ended up having to liquidate. I, I liquidated, excuse me, I liquidated a bunch of stuff at the end, a bunch of trailers, a bunch of reefers. And I sold all that stuff and I used it to pay the stuff that I couldn't pay when it got bad. Amazing. Wow. Right. So some, so I still, I basically wanted to take care of debts and, and stuff there. And I'm now back operating almost at level after since 2013. Oh man. Wow. No kidding. Yeah. So, that is what brought me to you. And I watched it and I see it. And obviously I like what you're doing. And um, I do love the trucking company or the trucking business, but it's not really what I wanted to do in my life. Yeah. However, I love money. And that's what I want to talk about right now today. Which love is, it. How important is money? A lot of people say, you don't fucking, you don't, money isn't everything. You need happiness. You need this. Yeah. I don't believe that. Yeah. What do you believe? Look, my, my system is very simple on that. Uh, you know, I watched my brother-in-law die uh, at 46 years old. He died two years ago. He left a wife and four kids with no health insurance, no life insurance, and a hundred bucks in the bank. And, um, you know, we helped him. We took care of all his bills uh, in an effort to try to get him better. He, he's my wife's uh, only brother, and they were just madly in love. Um, you know, I, I know that my wife is crazy about me, but I also know that she loved her brother more. And you could not have picked a worse person to leave my wife than her brother. And so, you know, that whole idea of money can't buy happiness and all that sort of stuff, it just doesn't work for me. You will never tell me that money doesn't matter. Um, you just could not convince me that money doesn't matter because I've seen what lack of money does in a, in a situation that's as grave as it could possibly be. And then I've seen what money does in a situation that, that alleviates some of that nastiness of a, of a terrible situation like that, right? My brother-in-law said to me, don't let my family go homeless, right? Right. Now, I mean, can, can, can you fix that problem? I mean, how are you going to fix that problem? You're going to have them move in with you because you don't got any money? Well, that doesn't probably yeah. doesn't fix your problem. You know how you fix the problem? You make sure they don't go homeless by paying their damn bills. Right. And you've got to have money to do that. And so I know that's a very harsh way of looking at it. And I'm not trying to discount the importance of happiness and balance and all of that sort of stuff. But I believe that you can do more and that you can have all of that stuff 
and that money is a vital component to happiness, period. I agree, 100%. What about, um, so some advice for some, obviously we've got a lot of, my audience is a lot of sales guys, a lot of smaller business people that are starting up. They don't cool. necessarily, they've never done, you know, it's not business guys like yourself or what I've done, but they're a little smaller. What type of advice do you have? For those I, talk about, I talk about all this stuff in my book, You Need More Money, um, which, is, uh, which is on Amazon right now for pre-order. It comes out March 20th. You Need More Money. It's the story of my brother-in-law. But, but it's a simple process, my friend, and here's how it goes. The, the first thing you have to do is you have to get your core values dialed in. I mean, really, what are you willing to tolerate? And who, who are you and what do you stand for? I don't think any of that stuff, you know, can be traded. So, for example, um, you know, in, in all of my years of being in business, I know for sure I have never fucked anybody ever never screwed a client over clients who aren't happy i give them their money back i've never missed a payroll and i pay every week in here every employee who has ever worked with me has been paid every nickel they ever earned i just that's a core value of mine i will never be looked at as somebody who fucked somebody else financially now have I stolen deals from somebody else? Have I heard about an opportunity and went in and grabbed it in a competitive marketplace? Of course. But if you put your trust in me, you never get screwed. So a person's got to get their core values done. There's a lot of guys, unfortunately, that are working in businesses in which they're doing things that are slightly unethical. And that's because their core values aren't tight. So they got to figure out what are they willing to tolerate? What are they willing to put up with? And what are they not willing to put up with? I, I like to say it in my book, The Grit, anything legal, anything right? It has to be legal and above board for me to be, be a part of it. I'm making some notes here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, ask yourself, you know, I mean, ask yourself this simple question. If a vendor came to you and said, Hey, would you give me the business? And you know, I'll send you a $250 gift card on the side. I won't tell your employer and you don't have to tell my employer. You have to understand what you're going to do in that situation. And by the way, that's a terminable offense in my office. If you took that deal, I don't give a shit how much money you make for me, your ass is fired. You stole from the organization and you would be fired for that. And I have it the opposite way, which is vendors will come to me and say, hey, would you, you know, I'll send you the business, would you send me a $250 gift card? And my stance is absolutely. But I'm also going to send you a W-9. And if your employer ever calls me and says, did you send him an a, a $250 gift card? My answer will be yes. Now, do you still want the $250 gift card? Right. And they always say, no, 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 don't do that. Smart. I mean, you, you might screw your employer, but I'm not going to screw your employer. Right. So first thing, you got to get the core values right. The second thing you got to do, my friends, you got to figure out what the platform is. Are you in a platform in which you can make the money that you need to make, right? Is somebody in the organization making the money that you want to make? Because if you make Subway sandwiches and you have these dreams of driving a Lambo, they don't connect. It's probably not going to happen unless you do my third step, which is pick your number, which is how much do you need to make? So, so you could make sandwiches at Subway and want to drive a Lambo, but you better have the aspiration to own 20 or 30 Subway sandwich shops. Right. But if you're just making the sandwiches, you're, you know, it's not going to happen. So those are the first three things that everybody has to do. They've got to figure out what are they willing to tolerate? What is their core value? What are they willing to stand for, to do or not do? The second thing is the platform capable of paying them the money that they want to make. And then the third thing is, what is that number? You have to pick your number. Is it 50 grand? Is it 75 grand? Is it 500 grand? The number's irrelevant to me, but most people have no clue what their number is. Well, you would agree with that, right? I agree 100%. And that's a huge component. Just figure out how much do you want to make and then go figure out where you can go get it. When did you decide how much you wanted to make? Look, I had a, I had a moment in my, my life, uh, you know, where my wife, um, my little five foot two redhead wife, we've been, we've been together 21 years, um, where I had to come clean with her that the business wasn't doing well uh, a number of years ago. And, um, and she, uh, she knew it but she was being nice to me, right? She had been pleasant to me all these years about it. And she just wasn't going to take the shit anymore. I mean, she was sick and tired of it. And so she told me, um, you know, she, she, 
the, 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 the memory, it's a sad memory for me because I can remember literally touching the doorknob going in, knowing what was about to happen, what the conversation was going to be. And, and, uh, and I told her we were in, we were in deep shit. We were really struggling. It's around 2008. Now listen, I started my company in 95, bad time to start. I built it up. Oh, one Oh two. We almost went out of business after September 11th. Nobody was buying trucks. It was a tough right. time. And then in 08, 09, in all intents and purposes, we were broke on paper, but I just kept showing up. Right. But it was around that time, and, 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 um, and she said, did you pay yourself this week? And I said, no. It was the first time I told her the truth because I hadn't paid myself in months. Okay. And then she said, did you, I'm going to ask you one more question. Did you pay your employees? And I said, yes. And she lost her mind and said, how could you do that to me and the boys? You know, how could you pay your employees before you paid your freaking family? And she was just crying uncontrollably, jumping up and down like, like, going crazy on me. And she said, one day you'll realize, Matt, that you are so much bigger than your business. One day you'll realize it. And that moment, you talk about comeback, right? right. That was a deciding moment for me that said, I'm going to grow a hundred million dollar business and I'm going to shut my wife up. And do you know, it took me 18 months to get it to that. And everything changed. It took 18 me 18 months. months to build it from that. Off of, off of that conversation. Obviously it was more to it, but that conversation that changed everything for me as far as, as far as this sort of, you know, just being chicken and feathers up and down, good to bad, to good, to bad, good to bad. And I just said enough of it. And, but you know, this in your life too, as so many other people should know, it doesn't have to be a long drawn out process, dude, it can change in an instant. And for me, it changed in that instant. And I've had multiple situations in my life in which at a very instantaneous decision, made all the difference. One of them was quitting booze, right? I quit booze in March of, of 1997. I never had a drink since. Never, never went to an AA meeting, never read the blue book, never talk about it. Don't wear it on my sleeve. Never had another drink instantaneously. And I can tell you this, my friend, my sobriety is more important than my marriage. It's the single most important thing in my life is my sobriety. And it happened just like that. Were you, were you a big drinker? Yeah, it was a problem. Yeah. There's no doubt it was a problem. <laughs> I went to a client meeting drunk and, um, I've done the same. <laughs> yeah. Big binge all weekend long. Monday morning, I roll out of bed, go to the client meeting. And the guy's like, you smell like booze, get the hell out. And I remember being in my car and my business was only two years old at the time. And, and I remember saying, man, if I don't get a handle on this, this thing's just going to implode on me. And I did. I, uh, I told you about that Generac contract that I signed, right? I walked in higher than giraffe pussy and was drinking, right? Like I literally wow. was, I was, and I went in there and I was so good at hiding it. I signed the contract, walked out, and I didn't even so much think I cared about the contract. I mean, I did, right? But I was like, man, I pulled one over on these guys, <laughs> right? Like I, I pulled just, another one. I pulled I handle, I handle my business in a, like booze don't phase me. This cocaine doesn't phase me. Mm, mm. But it turns out it really does. So have you, have you done the exploration as I assume you have as to, you know, why were you needing the booze and the coke? Maybe. Yeah, you know, I just had a conversation this morning about it. It 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 boils down to well, one, I'm a I'm a tight, I'm a wide open dude. I like adventure, right? Like I did, I raced motocross, I skied, we did backflips, we did all these wild things, right? And at some point, that stopped. The same high that I got off that stopped, and and I I found it in drugs and women and and drinking, right? But if you trace it down further, it was one moment. To when my dad, my dad and my brother, they were going to chase his dream, and I was running after the truck to try mm. to catch up with them, and they were gone, and then I didn't hear from them because they were going to do their thing, and that probably really hurt me pretty bad, you know. And then I think I kept the way that I found my confidence was by just becoming this wild person. I mean, I would fight. I would. I didn't care. I really didn't care. Mm -hmm. I can tell you some stories that were pretty gross, right? I was so hurt that I just wanted to hurt everybody. Hurt people, hurt people. Yeah, man. And, uh, but I had this gift to be able to build businesses and do the things I wanted to do. But, Dude, that's strong. How is your relationship with your dad and your brother now? So my brother and I are tight. Like I love, and that was the thing. It, it was more losing my brother, I think, that really hurt me. Him and I are still tight. Like he's got mm. three kids. He's got a fourth on the way. He's my little brother. And uh, we're super tight. Mm. My dad and I, my dad's got cancer right now and he doesn't talk to me. Hmm. Um, he doesn't talk to you. It sounds like, so you're saying you want to talk to him, but he won't talk back. You know, I don't know what to say. So he's got hmm. cancer, right? And I look at the stuff and I don't want to, I don't like to mention too much about him because then he hears these things and then he gets mad, right? Then he, he, he lives a different truth than me. 
Got it. And um, I guess he doesn't feel that I give him enough love, but at the same time, I'm like, how do I give you the love when I have a hard time even letting go of the shit that you did, right? The, the pain that you caused me. Mm. So we're just probably better, you know, mm. we'll figure it out. I hope so, man. I hope you guys, I hope you guys do. But uh, how about goals, man? So let's talk about, I know you probably got to get rolling here. Where, um, where are you going with this thing? Well, I mean, uh, you know, it's funny. Everybody always asks me, how does, how does the, you know, writing and, and speaking and all that stuff connect back to your business? So I was at Cardone's 10X Growth Con, right? And uh, literally the first day I get off the elevator, I'm walking to the registration. This is just last Thursday. And the first person that comes up to me says, uh, my name is Lou. And I just want you to know that I'm a big fan of your, your book and your videos and stuff. But you probably don't even know this, but three years ago, your company financed my first truck. That's cool. And I just want you to know that I'll never forget that. So people always say, well, what's the connection between the two? Dude, you don't know what the connection is between the two. You just know that it's happening. You know what right. I mean? We're helping, we're helping truckers and towers and construction guys get better at their business, get more focused at their business, run a better business. And if that makes them want to finance their equipment with us, then all the more power. We would love to be that choice. Um, it also, which is so important and why people do need a personal brand and a company brand, is everyone is being Googled. And so we compete with Wells Fargo and Bank of America and GE Capital. And before they say yes to us, they're typing our name into Google. And they want to see something. And we give them 900 videos to look at. Okay. And so there's not a client that does business with us that doesn't say we've looked at some of your videos and, and you have to put yourself out there. Look, you could do it with just one or two videos that just show up in organic ranking on page one. That's just fine. Just put videos on Google plus and give it a couple of days and it'll show up under your name. If you tag it properly, you don't right. have to have 900 videos and swim in pools and crap like that. Right. <laughs> but everybody needs to be found when they type their name into Google, you have to be found both personally and corporate. And so that's the driving force for me. The other piece of the puzzle is, and you know, as I was mentioning, as we were getting started, one of our banks is in town who, who buys our loans. You know, they're all jealous of the fact that we got our own studio in here and two guys outside this door and all this great equipment and all this sort of stuff. And I don't got to run it through legal or marketing. Right. If we feel like shooting it, we shoot it. And most of our competitors can't do that. So it's a competitive edge for us to be able to pump out as much content as we do. The last thing is, Dude, I, I know that um, this is a place where I'm supposed to be. I know that I can help underdogs who have been shit on and crapped on and counted out and that they can, they can win. And if you looked at my, my entire team here, we are a ragtag team and I am the leader. We come from all walks of life. We're short, we're fat, we're pretty, we're ugly. We've had success, we've had failures. We, we're, we're clean cut, we got tats. It's a mixture, it's a smorgasbord of people with an underlying layer of street smart toughness. And that's what I demand. I demand that you want more to come and be in my, in my ecosystem. And you know, I, we've got some people in here, dude. My, my number one guy's been with me 17 years. He'll make well over a million dollars this year. He has a two-year associate's degree from some college that I don't even know about. And he's working right next to a guy who will make 500 grand this year, who was the captain of his football team at Rice. I mean, Rice is the MIT of the South. You know what I mean? I mean, this, that just gives you this unbelievable dichotomy of the kind of people that, that work in my environment. And I want to fuel that for a lot more than 40 people. I want to fuel it for thousands and thousands of people who may have given up hope, who didn't get a shot. I want to tell them that, fuck, if I can do it, anybody can do it. And dude, I mean that. If my dumb ass can do it, anybody can do it. Because I just kept freaking showing up and doing this. Call, making money, not making money, making money. Just like you did, dude. You built your business on sales. Yep. If you learn how to sell, you can survive. If you learn how to bring value, you can win. If you learn how to talk to people, how to sit in front of somebody, how to build a relationship, how to be honest and look somebody in the freaking eye, you will win over time. You lose when you stop doing that shit. 
I agree 100%, man. Every time I thought, like, especially with this new internet stuff, the minute you take, you take the brakes off and these funnels and all these different things, right, and you rely on that, it's a lot different than when you actually have the manpower to pick up that fucking phone. Because every time I back myself into a corner, for whatever reason, the phone and the ability to sit and talk like this is what's got me out of it. Dude, you, you have that gift. And I have that gift. And a lot of people have that gift if they feel it. Look, here's one thing I can tell you. Your fucking click funnel ain't going to get you out of a problem. The phone or sitting in front of your client who's unhappy gets you out of the problem. Your click funnel doesn't do that shit. So you might be the greatest at click funnels. And congratulations for those people that have businesses that can thrive off of just click funnels. But if you need some sort of dialogue or conversation and you haven't gotten good at that, over time, you're fucked. I agree. You got to know how to talk to people. <laughs> so many people, especially, you know, the younger uh, millennials and stuff, they don't even want to use the phone. Like it's, it's all text message. And they, I, I don't know what the point of having a fucking phone is if you don't even want to talk on it. Dude, you know, a lot of those millennials got a bad rap, man. Dude, I was at 10X or 9,000 people. Most of them were in the millennial demographic and they're hungry, dude. Right. Well, there, I'm sure there's a ton out there. They're sick and tired of that bullshit, man. They want their piece of the American pie. Uh, there's a real hungry population of the millennials. In all frankness, most of the millennials I come in contact with are pretty hungry. Are they? That, that sort of, what, what do they say, entitled millennial? Yep. Dude, I ain't seeing that. I'm seeing hungry people who want their piece of the American pie. I like that. Where I'm at up here, man, it's entitlement. But I'm up here in the sticks in Wisconsin. So not a lot, really? of, not a lot of business kids up here. That's funny, man. I mean, I know, you know, there's some, the, the, like, like uh, the bank that's in town is from, uh, is from Minnetonka, Minnesota. Okay. And, you know, they, they are always recruiting like, uh, uh, you know, they like college athletes uh, from that area, right? That right. upper Midwest area um, who, you know, maybe even grew up on farms and stuff. I mean, they like that big, tough, aggressive farm boy and they can train him to be ambitious and, and aggressive and, and it's worked for them. They're huge. I want to sp I want to spit the uh, spin it here. I saw your son uh, get his four wheeler stuck on Instagram. So yeah. so I, I was thinking about that when I was talking to you. Uh, parenting, fatherhood. You're a great dad. You love it. Give me some uh, some tips and some guys. What, what does that mean to you? Out of all the money in the world, everything you're doing, what does that mean to you? Well, my, my it goes back to that core value piece, man. I can't shortchange that. My number one core value is to be a better father to my children than my father was to me. That is a number one core value for me. And so, you know, it manifests itself in many, many situations. I like to read to my boys every night. I don't read long passages. I'll just pick a quote and read it to them. Um, my kid says, let's go throw the ball. I got a beautiful sport court at my house. We go throw the ball. We go shoot hoops. My kid says, dad, let's go four wheeling today. Let's go four wheeling today. I mean, those are the things that my old man never did with me. And I'm required through my core values to do that. There's a lot of guilt with that too, though, dude. Don't, don't, don't let's not, let's not sugarcoat it. I'm on the road. I have pressure at my office. I'm trying to sell books. I'm trying to, you know, build a brand. Um, you know, I was away from my boys. I was with my wife last weekend, which was amazing. I'm in Vegas on Friday and Saturday. I'm in Florida Thursday, Friday, Saturday of next week. I only got so much time. So I got to make it work. I got to make it, I got to make myself present. And that's easier said than done. So parenting tip number one is your kids don't want to be with you for eight hours. So be present with them for one. And it how, old are, be how old are your boys? My boys are 16, 13, and 12. Okay. They don't want to be with you eight hours, man. They want to be with their girlfriends, dude. They want to be playing, um, uh, what's the new game that they all play? Um, the new video game that they all play. Oh, shit. My guy's only eight, so he's on like, he does want to be with me all day, every day. But Oh, dude, that's awesome. Congratulations, man. Rel I, know, I know the old folks have told you this, but really relish that, man, because, because they grow up fast. And the reality is they don't grow up, they don't leave you when they go to college. They leave you when they get their driver's license. Right. Right. My 16 year old wants to be in his Raptor with his girlfriend next to him, you know, gone every night. Go whether he's going to get ice cream or whatever, dude, he don't want to be home with me. He wants to be with his girl in his truck. Can't blame him. <laughs> can't blame him. I can't blame him. I did too, man. I wanted to be out so bad, man. The last thing I wanted to do was be at home, but I was leaving for different reasons. He's leaving for enjoyment. I was leaving to get the hell out. Right. I, can yeah. I was, I didn't really, it didn't really matter to me because I didn't really have anywhere to come like to not go home to right so for me it was just a place to freaking stay 
Yeah, like, man. I, I want Phoenix. My son, his name is Phoenix. I get up every day to make his life better. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's my core value. It really is. So, so, you know, that core value is, a, it, you know, I would, I would challenge you to spend more time expanding on what is those two or three core values that are just crystal clear for you. For me, you know, it is my number one core value is to be a better father to my children than my dad was to me. My second core value is, is to assist my wife and my children reach their God given potential. My third core value is to reach my own God given potential. Right. So, so those are pretty clarifying things for a guy like me, man. What the fuck am I doing this for? Right. And um, by the way, none of that has to do with money, right? I mean, I've already done chasing the money, which I think is a really important piece. Everybody's got to get their piece of the American pie, but sooner or later it will flip and you'll be able to incorporate both into it, right? Really driving towards your potential and making more money. But most people are caught up looking for potential when they should be looking for their piece of the American pie. Dude, you got to get a piece of the American pie first. Right. I feel like the reason that doesn't happen is so many people are after this fucking balance, right? Yeah, like they, kill that. They, they, for me, it's, it's top heavy on, on work, money, driving right now, and then the rest falls into place. When I have that, the fucking thing will tip over. Right? It'll, it'll start coming back and level out for me. But at the end of it, I want abundance in all areas. I was talking to Ed Milet about this, and we were both talking about what, what I call my constant state of pissed offness, right? I'm just always a little bit agitated, right? And, uh, and I don't run from that. A lot of people might hate that. And he was totally agreeing with me. And, and I said, well, how, how, how often do you think you are? He's like 90% of the time. And I said, that's awesome because I say it's about the same to me. I said, but let me tell you what it does do for both of us. It makes us relish the 10% that we're not, right? It makes the 10% that we're present, that we're dialed in, that we're where we want to be so amazingly powerful because for most of the rest of the time, we're just a little pissed, you know? <laughs> we're just a little hungry all the time. And it makes the 10% just magical. And he couldn't agree more. I like that. that. That's a guy that I just started watching here a little while back. Um, he just popped on to Ed Milet, and then I realized he's a beast, right? So. Dude, he's the real deal. Ed Milet's the Ed, Ed Milet is the real deal and rich. Really great guy, though. I mean, but rich. I'm going to have to check him out a little bit. More. He's a great, great guy. We can all learn from, from him. I mean, and you know, one of the things I realized too, man, is I start to meet some of those people. Everybody thinks, oh man, they must be living double lives, right? It's just the way they are on camera. They're all, they're real bastards, those guys. No, listen, man, they love their kids. They, they all put their pants on the same way. They're all looking to help everybody. They real, there are a lot of real deals that people think are, you know, shams and stuff. My experience is they're amazing people. And that's a Cardone. That's a Milet. That's a Brad Lee. It's coach bird. It's Tim story. It's even Ty Lopez or Lewis house guys that I met this past weekend. They're all really good dudes. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Matt, we're coming up on time here, man. I really, I, there's so many more things I could talk to you about. So maybe we'll have to do this again, but can you, the books, the stuff you have out there, where can my listeners find you? Go ahead and give yourself a little PR plug here and hopefully get some. Uh... The best place is the podcast, the You Need More Money podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast from. Type in You Need More Money. The book is out in pre order, so you can get it on Amazon, Walmart, Target, wherever. And, um, and it will ship on March 20th. You can get it in Audible, you can get it in Kindle, or you can get the hard copy. Um, and all of that comes available on March 20th. The book is selling great. But I, I'm not abashed to say this. I need to sell 50,000 copies of that book in the first six months to make the New York Times bestseller list. And I want to make the New York Times bestseller. So my point is, I can't sell one book at a time. I need to ask your audience to buy multiple. Buy them for your family. Buy them for your friends. Buy them from your, for your sales staff. Buy them for your clients or your vendors, people that you care about. Because my story in that book is the real, it's, it's legit. It's exactly how it happened for me. And, and what are the steps that I did, man, to fix my money situation after a long time of struggle? And it worked. And it can work for anybody. Why do I'm going to get a couple copies? Thank you, buddy. I appreciate that, well, man. I really do. I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Matt, I appreciate your time today, man. I know you got a lot of stuff to do. Thanks for taking it out and hanging out with us. And uh, we'll talk to you soon, bud. Dude, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invite. I'll see you down the road, okay? All right, man. Take care. Peace. Bye.